So, Andreas, how the hell did you get into such an esoteric thing as translating Marx and Engels' works into Irish? Well, I mean, I happen to be an Irish speaker and I happen to be a Marxist, so the two things, I think, needed to come together at some point. I, th- I mean, I, I've been kind of doing my bits as, as far as I can to try and spread Marxist ideas over the years. And I think I was in a position to kind of do that amongst Irish speakers. There was a kind of a, a group of people there who weren't necessarily being exposed to Marxist ideas. So I tried to do that over the years. I wrote a biography of Marx and one of Engels, largely to introduce people to, the, to, to their work and their ideas, to get people thinking about it, which were fairly well received. And I've been kind of promising or threatening over the years that, you know, the sort of the main works of, of Marx and Engels, I think, would be should have been should be translated into Irish. And then the when the, the, the bicentenary of Marx's birth came along in 2018, it finally kind of kicked me into, into action. If I didn't do it now, I'd never get it done. So I did a selection of kind of the main, you know, works of Marx uh, and translated them, some in full, some kind of extracts, to give people a basic kind of grounding in the main ideas of Marx in Irish. And then a couple of years later, for, for Engels, Bicentenary did the same for him. I think there's, you know, there's a, there is a kind of an audience amongst Irish speakers for, for Marxist ideas, not a huge one any more than anyone else, but I think people are prepared to, to, to listen. And in terms of, of, of publishing, they've not, not made anyone rich or anything, but they've been more successful than I think me or my long suffering publisher were, were expecting. But, um, you know, this, I, I think it proves, you know, people, People are certainly not close to the idea. People don't sort of, you know, shut down before the idea of Marx and Irish. I think people, you know, have a, a lot of people have a kind of a, a very open, welcoming attitude towards the, the notion. And who is your publisher then of the books? Kosh Game, which is kind of said the biggest publisher in Irish. And they, they, they published those books and published the, the biographies they did. And they're kind of open generally to, um, they take a big interest in history and politics more so than, than other publishers who I suppose would focus more on fiction, although Koshkin publishes fiction and poetry and all the rest of it as well. So the, 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 they're a mainstream publisher. The books are available in kind of everyday bookshops in, in, in Dublin or Belfast or wherever and uh, can be got online. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a kind of a fringe left-wing publisher. It's kind of in the mainstream of, of, of Irish language publishing. And the, the book on Engels even got a grant from the Higher Education Authority to, to help with the publication. So... You know, the revolution gets help from unexpected places sometimes, you know. <laughs> That's for certain. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how did you, because you were just talking before we came online that you actually grew up in London near where I'm here, just down the road from me. How did you get into Irish then? Yeah, I mean, I, did, I had Irish parents and we were kind of, you know, like a lot of Irish people at that time in the 70s and 80s had a kind of a, a sort of a London Irish upbringing. But my parents aren't. Irish speakers. I kind of got into Irish myself later on, started learning when I was still in England. And then when I moved back as a teenager, kind of got more into it and um, began. And I was already by then kind of a, a socialist interest in left wing ideas. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff I've written in the meantime has been focusing on that stuff on, on Marx and Engels, but also on stuff on James Connolly, for instance. So it seemed natural that this is this is the kind of thing. This is the kind of thing I was interested in. This is the kind of thing I believed everyone else should be interested in so that's that's how I got into that when I started writing in Irish. Did you spend much time now in going to Gael talks and stuff because your accent to me I can pick up bits of bits of English but bits of Dublin but also bits of kind of like I would have said like you know the west or something in there. Yeah oh, well I'm originally from Roscommon I lived there when I first moved back so there's there's a kind of mixture of everything in here. When I speak Irish I, I, I have a different accent it's a kind of a, a sort of a Galway Irish accent so um it's a strange kind of mixture. There's a lot of people who I know who, who, who are Irish speakers, who people I've known for years. And when they hear me speak in English, they kind of think, Where, where's this kind of Cockney strain kind of coming from? So <laughs> it's a, it's a weird, it's got, it's, I don't, maybe it's dialectical, you know? Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to everything. <laughs> it's dialectical, Captain. Um, <laughs> well, what is it like translating then into Irish? like for some of Marx and Engels stuff, which is quite technical, like what is the, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of times like people kind of typically, like I remember being in, in school and we had like, I went to school with some boys from Rakarn, which is a Gaeltacht area near where I grew up. And 
I remember a teacher asking them one time, you know, what's the Irish for a deep freeze? And uh, the guy say, you know, on deep freeze. <laughs> so dead <laughs> deep freeze. Like, and what kind of, and what kind of difficulty does translating into technical language, you know, some of Marx or Engels' works for words that probably maybe not even have been in the language at the time of when they were written, you know, in the Irish language, say? Yeah, it's kind of, it's, inter it's interesting in many ways because, I mean, Irish is a minority language even in, I in Ireland. So it's kind of been, I mean, for, for hundreds of years, it was, a, it was one of the major literary languages of, 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 of Europe. You know, there was a lot of the, the thought of the time was being written and expressed in Irish. And that's not been so much in the last couple of years, the last couple of centuries with Irish being kind of marginalised especially from the time of the famine onwards and that. Uh, and Irish became associated with poverty and exclusion. And, of course, people who were, who were hoping to emigrate to America or England or whatever, often kind of learning the English language and dropping Irish was the kind of main concern from an economic point of view. So that kind of marginalised the language and meant that a lot of these ideas, these big political ideas of the time that were coming forward, didn't really find expression in Irish. But it's interesting that they did. I mean, one of the things I'm working on at the moment is a kind of a study of Irish speaking socialists in the early 20th century and around the time this would be around the time of sort of James Connolly who's who had a few words of Irish himself but not much you'll find people making arguments in Irish work come finding the words big discussion over what would be the correct Irish word for socialism and different words being used and you know the word we have now socialist wasn't the word initially used it was kind of it came in later on but there's there had been attempts and, and sort of some of the work I've done over the years have been trying to sort of explore that tradition and, and, and kind of introduce it to people. But there was a challenge to be done because some of these words hadn't really been translated. No one, I mean, I, I translated bits from Capital, so no one really had gone into, you know, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall in Irish, as far as I can tell. And the, the thing is, it actually translates easier into Irish than to English. I mean, the phrase in English is quite a mouthful. Uh, which is why some people do this thing which annoys me where they call it TPRF or whatever, which means you have to kind of decode the right the writings and all, all the rest of it. In Irish, it's a fairly short phrase, similar to what it is in German. Again, surplus value in German is a short compound word, eight letters. In Irish, it's a short compound compound word of nine letters. Whereas in English it's it's a two-word phrase. You know, so sometimes the structure of the languages fits better in Irish. You know, so there's no reason now, I mean, there's a problem because of the kind of the minority position that the Irish has in society, which kind of mitigates against it. But I mean, there's no linguistic reason why these kind of ideas can't be expressed in Irish. That's what that's what I was kind of hoping anyway. That's what I was kind of being motivated by. And, you know, the challenge of kind of being, you know, completely faithful, getting to these the ideas of Marx, which, which I'm kind of the, the ideas I agree with myself, getting them across faithfully and properly and accurately but also in a way which people would would recognize as kind of proper irish expression which irish speakers would would be able to to kind of see as as this this is this is our language this is what it says these ideas are not foreign to us they they, they fit in you know so that was a, that was a challenge an interesting one i mean people have their own views how successful i was but i i mean i certainly i certainly relished sort of having a go at it you know so I'm a very big falling rate of profit guy. So you're going to have to tell me what's the Irish for the tendential <laughs> fall in the rate of profit. Come on now. Clean a titter and rot a brabby. Clean a titter and rot a babby. Yep. There you go. Very good. I'm going to have to start using that one now. Instead of the yeah. TPRF or whatever, I'm going to use that and really confuse the shit out of people. <laughs> um, <laughs> Talk, just talk about the state of the Irish language at the moment. Is there, am I correct in saying there's a bit of a revival going on in, in teaching through Irish, that there's a lot of Gale schools? It's been driven mostly by the by the parents, as far as I know. Is it, am I correct on this? There is a, been a, a huge increase over the last kind of like 30, 40 years in the Gale school and the Irish language schools. And this, these are schools in English speaking areas where everything is taught through Irish. And there is, there's been a, a huge kind of growth in them. There's a bigger demand for them than the than the supply, you know. Like in the part of Dublin where I live, there there isn't one, but there's a huge demand for one, and it's been decided that the next primary school that we hope that will be opened here will be a Gael school. And still, you know, the number of people who are asked would they like to uh, send their kids to a Gael school is always higher than than what's available. Now the thing is, often 
the people who send their kids to a school don't speak Irish themselves. But the, the kids kind of pick up a basic knowledge of Irish, get into the habit of speaking Irish naturally when they go to school every day. So it's not, you know, it's not a lesson. It's not sort of, okay, for the next hour, we're going to write Irish on the blackboard and you're going to write it down in your copybook. It becomes more of a natural thing. It's the language that they that they speak, that they play in and, and, and so on. It kind of helps to, to, to pass it on to a new generation. There's a problem then, of course, when it gets to, to second level, the supply of Irish schools at the, the secondary level doesn't keep up with it. And then again, third level at the, the university level, there's not a huge amount apart from Irish itself is taught through Irish. But say, for instance, someone, there would be people who wanted to say, for instance, study history or maths through Irish. This is not an option at university level, even though you might have done all your education up to the age of 18 in Irish, you're forced to, to speak, to, to, to switch over to English at third level. But there's a very sort of positive attitude to Irish, which doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily kind of solve all the problems because the Gaeltacht, which is the Irish speaking areas, the communities where people speak Irish, not just at school, but at home and when they meet each other in the street, are, are kind of shrinking and the language is under attack because for the same reason as hundreds of other minority languages and cultures are under attack because as effectively, you know, capitalism kind of likes big languages and doesn't like diversity. And so, for instance, when a multinational company sets up in the Gaeltacht, they expect people to speak English. There's been cases where people have been disciplined for speaking Irish on the factory floor in Gaeltacht areas. Capitalism is not a good a good system for promoting diversity and people and, and, and the idea of people having in, indigenous cultures. It tends to, to mitigate against that. So, you know, in terms of allowing these areas, which are largely for the most part kind of isolated areas, which are lack, you know, basic economic requisites and infrastructure and all the rest of it, is a challenge which, you know, ultimately, I think, leads people to the kind of ideas that Marx or Engels were putting forward, which is that you need radical social change where, so that communities like this can survive and people can, conti can continue to live in, in their own way. So I think that kind of, again, feeds into the way that there's an opening amongst Irish speakers for, the, for, for, those, for those type of ideas. From my point of view, I always think the Irish state has had a very, very deleterious role in the you know in the nature of how the irish language has developed like there has been no there's been no effort to really rescue the language like say a revival in wales or say in israel of of hebrew they've kind of they paid only kind of a lip service to it by making sure everything there's an irish translation but not actual real policies that will bring the language back from because it's on its knees at the moment yeah i mean there's there's always been a kind of a token idea that you know the nods in the direction of irish you know so, for instance, I, Irish is taught at school, but it's often taught by teachers who are not that great at Irish themselves, which leads to resentment on their part on, on, and leads to people learning Irish from which isn't that great. And that, you know, all around leads to people leaving school with a very, very negative attitude towards the language because of the, the way it was presented to them. That's kind of Im improved better. In the Gael School, it's more natural. It's not just you suddenly switch to Irish for, a, for half an hour a day. It's kind of part of the fabric of it. So the more that develops, it, it helps. Also, things like the fact there's now a television channel in Irish for the last 20 years or so, and a radio station as well, which, which were both things which had to be forced. The state didn't give them. Huge campaigns had to take place, including people breaking the laws, pirate radio stations, people climbing up the mast in RTE, the main television station, people breaking the law, refusing to pay TV licenses. These were sort of radical campaigns that were needed to force the state, which officially is committed to the Irish language, to actually take practical measures that would help them you know and that's that's still ongoing today i mean the the huge economic challenge that's involved in making Gaeltacht area survive is something that the irish state does not want to get into it, it would rather carry on you know attracting multinational investment and and making sure that the island is safe for the banks you know so i mean there's a real people who want the irish language to survive people who want to be able to speak irish with their kids and and the, the kids to be able to speak irish when they grow up are almost brought, whether they want to or not, into some kind of a challenge against the powers that be, you know, and often that gives people a sympathy for the underdog, you know, a kind of a, an identification with other people who are struggling for rights in other countries and other places around the world. So, you know, all of that, I think, adds up to the fact that there's always been an audience down the years for left-wing ideas in Irish, and I think that's that's still the case today. When I'm at home, I watch Tina G quite a bit, actually. Now, my Irish isn't very good. But, you know, there's a lot of sport on it and they have like the commentary in Irish. So I think 
like a lot of Irish people are, have, you know, can watch a rugby or a hurling match and understand the Irish, the vocabulary for there. But like in general language, they, they wouldn't be able to like order stuff in the shops here as well. You know, so it's kind of weird how I personally relate to the Irish language, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange kind of situation. I mean, there's not it's like UNESCO officially defines Irish as a definitely endangered language. It's in that category. But at the same time, it's a language which officially has state recognition and is in the education system in, in every school in the in the state. So it's a kind of a unusual situation. And I think, you know, to go into all that involves kind of going back to sort of the peculiarities of Ireland's history over the years. But it, it's very difficult. And there's kind of the idea of having something like Marx or Engels being discussed in Irish, again, kind of helps break down the idea, which a lot of people have brought up with that, that Irish is to do is an old fashioned thing as a parochial language is to do with the old Ireland and, you know, the old fashioned ideas. There has always been over the years an open, even amongst people who are trying to revive Irish, an opening to the world. The idea is that Irish should be able to express these ideas and discuss these ideas. So, you know, the people, you know, as they go along, you'll find people. So people who are into sport, as you say, will pick up the words for sport. People go to demonstrations, political demonstrations against the government or whatever, and see placards in Irish and suddenly suddenly they know the Irish for saying that, you know, you know, the, the government is wrong. People, you know, these p- group of people on strike should get the pay rise they're looking for, that kind of thing. And, you know, when Irish is present in that kind of context, when people see Irish as a language of, of protest and of moving for, you know, in, for change and for a be- making the world a better place, that kind of helps the language itself, that it kind of gives people a more positive attitude and people see that it's part of the change that, that's needed in society. So that, that I think all feeds into it as well. I was up in Aaron Moore off the Donegal coast there when the islands last summer or the summer before, and they had a plaque there to like an Irish socialist called Padder O'Donnell. I don't know. Have you heard of him? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so I wasn't really, I, I hadn't heard of him, I must admit. You know, I was quite surprised that, you know, that I think it was in Irish as well, that I was quite surprised that, you know, sometimes you don't even think that like socialism could have been alive in like some of the, like literally the remotest parts of the country back, you know, a hundred years ago. You know, socialism has a long history in the Irish speaking parts. You know, it's not a you're not injecting something new with these translations into the language. Yeah. And the thing is, as well, because of the history of emigration, because so many people from Ireland have, have traveled around the world and people from the Gaeltacht as one of the poorest parts of Ireland have traveled more than most. People have been exposed to the world. People have been exposed to what happens in, in not just in Britain, but in America and wherever, Australia. And you'll find. At the strangest places, you'll find Irish speakers pop up here and there. You know, like a lot of, like for instance, one of the the earliest Irish Trotskyists was a, a man called Thomas O'Flaherty, who was the brother of Liam O'Flaherty, the uh, the novelist, who was involved in the American Communist Party and became one of the first people to hear what Trotsky was saying in the late twenties. And these kind of things pop up all the time. He moved back to Ireland and was involved in a left wing newspaper here, and people kind of sometimes find it strange, but at all times. Even, for instance, the way in the late 60s, there was a Gaeltacht civil rights movement, which has drew from the civil rights movement in the north of Ireland, but also the civil rights movement in America, which a lot of people had experienced firsthand. A lot of people had relatives and friends who lived in the US and saw what had happened. And people did the same thing here, had marches and demanded civil rights and walked out, marched down to Dublin and got battened off O'Connell Street by the, by the, by the guards and all this kind of stuff. And there was, you know, whenever there has been moves in radical direction in Irish politics whenever there's been you know movements looking for real change in 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 Irish society society the language the Irish language and Irish speakers have been in there and that's a, that's a kind of tradition which isn't that well known it's not it's not really what you get taught at school but um it's there and i think you know it's important to 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 show that it's there and to 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 carry it on really andres you've recently been translating some of Engels' works on the state. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I mean, one of the big questions that Engels faced in his writings was the state, what it would be, what it exactly was, how it came into being, what kind of transformation it would undergo in the event of a socialist revolution. And you can find this all through kind of what Marx and Engels wrote. And generally speaking, the idea is fairly clear that that a socialist revolution would result in a society without a state, that the state would, would, would disappear, that this kind of idea of having a coercive force of 
police and soldiers and prisons and all the rest of it would go by the by. There's various kind of emphasis you find in their writings as to whether this would be a gradual process or a quick process or how soon it would begin, how soon it would it would finish. But it's a it's a fairly kind of constant theme that this is this is socialist society that they were talking about that would emerge from a revolution would eventually get rid of the state. And this is something that Engels deals with as well in Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, which is obviously one of the famous texts of his, one of the famous texts of Marxist thought, which has been a huge hit with people ever since it was it was first published. And when I was doing the translation, I, I compared various versions of the of the book. It was originally published as a series of articles. It emerged from a, a wider work directed at Eugen Düring, uh, uh, an academic in Germany who had announced that he was a socialist and Engels was was, was criticising. But when the what I noticed was there, there was quite significant changes that had taken place from one version of the text to another, from the original series of articles which were published in a German socialist newspaper until the final German edition of Socialism, Utopian and Scientific in 1882. There were quite big differences, and these differences had seemed to have gone unnoticed. So when I did the translation, I kind of noticed what these differences were, and it seemed to me strange that these hadn't been commented on before, as far as I could see. So the first article he wrote uh, against during in uh, Vorwärts was in, I think, January 77. So we're seeing mm. a kind of a change over maybe a five-year period. Yeah, yeah, between that and the, the, the German, there's a kind of a, a, a different, there's the, the, the series of newspaper articles which are published start in 1877 till the middle of 78. Very soon after that, they're published in book form in German. Then a few chapters are selected out of that and published as a pamphlet, Socialism, Utopian, Scientific, in French translation. Then Engels prepares a German version in 1882. And the thing is, at that point in 1882 is when you see the changes come in, things which are different to the original version of 77, 78. And sometimes they're just minor things, they're fairly stylistic points. But on some issues, they're, they're I think, are quite significant shifts in, in his thought and, and on the point of the state a very famous passage of Engels kind of changed considerably there. So what was this passage then that we're talking about here? Okay, this is this is one where, which would be well known, but this, the original version appeared in Vorwärts, the German socialist newspaper in May 1878, said, I'll just read it out here, the first act by which the state truly comes forward as a representative of the whole society, taking possession of the main, means of production, the name of society, is at the same time its last act a state. In place of the governing of persons comes the administration of things and the direction of production processes. The free society can have no use for and cannot tolerate any state between itself and its members. It's in this light that the catchphrase about the free state is to be judged, both in terms of its agitational justification for the time being and its ultimate scientific insufficiency. So that, that's how it appeared in May 1878 and in the first edition of uh, Eugen Dürring's Revolution in Science, which was what the book was called when the, when the articles were published as a whole. That's, that's how it appeared in 1878. And again, in 1880, there's kind of minor, in the French translation, there's kind of slight tradition, slight uh, changes, stylistic for the most part in that attitude. The mention of the free state doesn't come up, presumably because Engels thought that wouldn't be relevant to readers in France. It was a kind of an argument going on within the German socialist movement. But that, stays the same. It's in 1882 when there's a, um, a German edition of Socialism and Utopian and Scientific being prepared. Engels revises it and, and there's evidence in his letters that he said he was doing quite a, a thorough revision, particularly of the, the final section of the pamphlet, which is where this comes in. And it, it appears then in a, a different form, if you like. So what were the changes then between the, the original and, and this, this latter form? So the, the, the first sentence I mentioned there about the, the state taking control of the means of production being its last act as state, that now becomes its last independent act. And the significance of that is it's, you could argue about maybe there were other acts envisioned there. Then another sentence is brought in where Engels writes, the intervention of a state power in social relations becomes superfluous in one sphere after another and get, then goes to sleep by itself. That wasn't in the first edition. And then later on, later on, after the thing about 
governing of persons being replaced by administration. He adds in a sentence, which is famous now at this point anyway, the state is not abolished, it dies out. And then at the end, when he talks about the free state slogan, he says, and in this light too can be judged, in this light too, the demand of the so-called anarchists that the state should be abolished overnight. So there's changes being brought in there, which I think shift it from a, a kind of, into a less kind of libertarian uh, direction, if you like. These are all kind of, you know, these great words have to be used with great caution, but it's not as libertarian. The state is not as opposed as, as strongly as it was. The bit about uh, saying that a, a free society can't tolerate a state, that's been dropped. And instead, we have a say a, a, a sort of affirmation that the state can't be abolished. It kind of it dies out. So it becomes a sort of a longer process, and, and a process which kind of happens almost by itself. You know, it it's, it seems like there is a less emphasis on a kind of revolutionary disruption and throwing out of the state. Yeah, I mean, it kind of it's seen as almost a natural result that that happens. It, you kind of you don't really really need to get too worried about it. Just once we've done the revolution, the state will kind of look after itself and it'll it'll fall asleep and go off by its own accord. So that's, I think, a fair, fairly important shift of emphasis. I mean, people could argue back and forth over whether that was a more realistic point of view than the earlier one or whether it's, it's as you, I think, I think you'd be right in saying it's less revolutionary. There's a lot of emphasis on the idea of actively deciding to get rid of the state, to, to throw, throw it away. So that's, that's, I think, an important, an important shift there uh, uh, certainly in emphasis at least you mentioned there that it, this shift might have had something to do with uh, johan most do you want to describe who he was and and what the arguments were with him yeah he was um he was someone engels was not a fan of at all he was um he was a parliamentary deputy in the german socialist party in the 70s and when this fella during announced he was a now a supporter of the of the party the spd there was a great welcome for this. They thought this was a huge feather in their cap. This big sort of academic who now was on our side. The problem was that when instead of just saying, right now I support you, what do you want me to do? Give me some leaflets to hand out in, or whatever. He said, I, I agree with you now. And by the way, you've been getting all these things wrong and you should listen to me. He was kind of um, had this, according to himself, he was putting socialism on a higher philosophical basis. And this was what Engels got annoyed with in the first place and why he, he kind of decided to take him on. The articles he wrote against Turing faced a lot of opposition amongst leading members of the, the, the Socialist Party in Germany, including Most, who led an attempt to prevent them being published. Uh, he, he brought in resolutions of conferences saying these articles should be stopped, they shouldn't be published. In the end, there was a kind of a compromise reach where they were still published, but not in the main newspaper. They were kind of shunted off to a, a supplement at the back of the newspaper out of the way. So Most was, was not someone that Engels was a big fan of. And around the time he was doing this revision of the pamphlet in 1882, there's a, a mention in the letter where he, he kind of refers again to what Most was up to. But by this stage in 1882, Most had, was no longer a parliamentary deputy. He'd become an anarchist. He was now saying that the, the state should be uh, abolished. The state should be abolished and that, that would be the solution to the, 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 the problems of, of the world. And Engels, I think, at this stage, may have been, you know, anxious to argue against Most. You know, Most had been expelled from the party because of these views. And there were some people who thought that was a bit harsh. Engels didn't. Engels wanted to kind of make quite clear that this kind of person was no use to the party. We were quite right to throw him out. He had nothing to add. So the ideas of Most are kind of the ideas that he's arguing against, the idea that you just abolish the state and that's the end of it, are what he's arguing against. So it's possible that that's, what, uh, that's why he made the change he did. That's only speculation. There's something similar shortly afterwards in, in 1883 when Marx died. Must claimed, was still putting forward these same ideas, but claimed that Marx agreed with him. And Engels, you know, uh, shortly after Marx died, wrote a very clear reply to that word saying that Marx d did not agree with these ideas. And the thing he said, what he writes in that about the state where he says, um, in that article, he says um, that, that Marx believed, as he did himself, that one of the final results of the future pro proletarian revolution would be the gradual dissolution and ultimate disappearance of the political organization called the state. Now, that's very similar to what he wrote a few months earlier in the revision. It's a, he's talking about a gradual dissolution 
and ultimate disappearance. So it's a longer time frame. And again, that's in the context of replying to Most. So that leads me to think, and it's, you know, it's an educated guess more than anything else, but it leads me to think that maybe the influence of Johann Most was 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 on Engels' mind when he made this 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 revision to the pamphlet a few months before that. And then we get to again, there is an 1885 edition of basically well, what I I've normally kind of known the two texts, one as uh, anti during. <laughs> So, like, mm. is it actually called technically called anti during every anywhere? Is that just like what people say? Or That's that a nickname. It? I mean, it's it was yeah. it was called uh, Herr Eugen During's Revolution in Science, which is a kind of a ironic title, but it's a bit of a mouthful. But um, anti during, it's not the most elegant title, but I suppose it's uh, it's what it's, it's known as anti during. Yeah. In the English, tra- there's an, like an English translation. The the word that like. Personally, I I've always heard was uh, the state withering away, like it withers away. Yeah. When did that come into being? Okay, well, there was an English translation of Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, which came out in eighteen ninety two, and Engels were very closely involved in that, and uh, he kind of edited it basically. And the phrase used there is 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 the one I use there: the state isn't abolished, it dies out. Um, there were various other phrases used in other translations. In that one that comes forward, it withers away. That's that's later. The earliest version I've seen of that is from the the nineteen thirties, and it's not wrong. As the the the, the German is stirbt uh, abt, which is literally it dies out. Which you know, dying out can be sort of dropping dead, but it can also be sort of slowly, sort of drifting off. So it could be withering away. But I think the withering away thing, which you know, I, I've often heard many times, as you say, but. It kind of suggests even longer time frame that it's something that's very gradual and you know we could be here for a long time before we see the final sort of disappearance of the state but if anything it was kind of going even further in that direction away from you know sweeping aside the state and more from just kind of sitting back and watching it watching it go away by itself you know yeah our experience of the 20th and early 21st century has not been of a withering away of the state i mean this this is it i mean the thing is, I mean, especially in the light of that experience, you know, anyone who sort of argues for a socialist revolution has to deal with that fear. There's a very widespread fear and belief that this, any of this kind of revolution would lead to, you know, a really vicious kind of a state which would be looking over our shoulder all the time, telling us what to do and locking us up if we say the wrong thing. And, you know, I think we need to have some kind of a credible answer to that. You know, I don't, and I don't think it will do to say, "Ah, sure, it'll just go away by itself." Don't worry it'll about either. it. Yeah, I think we need to it, come up. Yeah, we need to come up with some kind of. I mean, obviously, it's not possible to say in advance this is exactly how it'll go. This is, you know, a, you know, five years after the revolution, we'll abolish this. Or say, it kind of depends on the situation the revolution finds itself. It depends most of all on the resistance that the revolution faces from from the capitalist is trying to abolish. But you know. I think we need to sort of have a bit bit more kind of an active idea of doing it, that what we want to do is to get rid of this state as soon as it's done its job. You know, it, it, would, it would be necessary because you're dealing with a very powerful and vicious class when you're talking about the capitalists, they will likely do everything to hold on to their power. We're going to need to defend the revolution against them and try and, you know, push them back. But as, as soon as there's no need for them, you know, we want to get rid of this. And I think a, a revolution, a kind of a healthy revolution that was kind of successful, that was doing its job, would would feature debates back and forth from people saying, can we get rid of this? Do we need to have, you know, the local workers' militia? You know, can we, call, is it time now? Can we, can we decommission them? Can we stand them down? Can we get rid of this or that aspect of state power? And I think a successful revolution would be looking as soon as possible to to kind of do that, to move on and get rid of that. And where revolutions end up kind of holding on to the state and consolidating the state, it's because they've kind of gone off the rails because they're going in a, a different direction, not towards the, the idea of socialism that Engels or Marx believed in, you know? Why do you think he was so ambiguous? Like, do you think it was these political battles always that was at the root of it? I think the thing with Engels is it's kind of, this is one of his, his great kind of virtues, was he was extremely good as a popularizer of Marxism. You know, Marx would often go off and spend years and years on some very kind of intricate point, which wasn't necessarily immediately relevant to what 
a, a socialist party would be doing from week to week. Whereas Engels was the one who would take these ideas and put them in a form where people could could read them and understand them and, 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 and grasp them very well. And there's a kind of a danger in any kind of popularization that you can miss some of the subtleties. And especially when you're arguing against someone, there's always a tendency to kind of maybe go too far in the other direction. If someone says, you know, you, if someone says something that's wrong, you can almost kind of go too far the other direction in, in kind of trying to refute them. And I think when Engels heard people say, we're going to abolish the state and that's all there is to it, he was kind of forced to say, well, no, that's not how you, how you can do it. You need, there's a whole need sort of sweeping series of social and economic changes that would need to be done before the need for a state could, could, could go. And I think maybe he just went too far in saying, you know, it dies out of itself. You don't need to abolish it. There's no kind of conscious decision to get rid of it. And it's the old thing of kind of, you know, when people bend the stick, you bend the stick sometimes too far the other way. I don't, I think Marx would have been more kind of cautious. Uh, I don't think Marx would have said something as, as outright as, as, as that. And, and the thing is, well, at, at other times after that, some of the statements Engels made were kind of very different to that. So there's, there's, there's a famous one in The Origin of the Family where he says that uh, a successful revolution will throw the state into the museum where it belongs, along with the, the bronze axe and all this. And the, there's another bit where he, he talks about in the, the introduction to the Civil War in France, to Marx's Civil War in France, where he says a, a new generation after a social, socialist revolution will be able to throw the entire state machinery onto the scrap heap. Now, that's, that's abolishing the state. That's a, a, the people deciding we need to put this into the museum. We need to throw this on the scrap heap. It's not saying let's sit back and watch and wait till it goes and it's all, all in its own good time. So, you know, there's kind of contradictions there. And sometimes Engels put maybe too much emphasis in the wrong direction. I, I mean, I'm not arguing here that Engels was quite kind of was, was someone who was completely wrong. I just think in this particular case, he was maybe led to put the emphasis in the wrong direction. You know? Yeah, and you said it in the article that it's quite surprising when you went through it that there was no real discussion in the literature about these translation and changes, modifications upon this topic. Yeah, I mean, that, that surprised me because if you look at, say, the collected works, which, which started coming out in the 70s, and the, the German language co collected works, the Werke, which were published in the 60s and 70s, they're fine editions. I mean, any, anyone who's kind of used them is, cannot but be impressed with the sort of scholarship that's involved there. And generally, they tend to go into big detail on how text changes. You'll see footnotes saying, in the first edition, this was phrased slightly differently, and sometimes even quite minor changes. But of course, it, I mean, it should be left up to the reader to decide what's, what's important or unimportant. It shouldn't be sort of imposed on them. But in this, it doesn't appear. If you look in the Collected Works, which was the, the volume that was published in um, 89, or if you look in the, the, the volume of the Verka that was published in the 60s, there's change. There's no comparison made to the original uh, version of the book and the original articles as they were published. And I don't know why this is. It kind of, it seems very strange why it's been done with other texts, but not with that. I don't know wh whether the, the people who brought them out saw it as insignificant. If they did, I think that's a very bad judgment. Or whether they just r would rather that it wasn't discussed because it was a, it was a, it was an issue that they r would rather not go into. That that you know the question in how Engels' idea and the and the state kind of shifted from one side to the other over the years is not something they they wanted to get into. But it's, I mean, I think, as far as I can see, that when I did that in, in the Irish translation, it seems to be the first time it was ever done, which is very surprising. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very strange that that, that, that that kind of comparison wasn't done. Yeah, as a good materialist, I have a fair suspicion about why <laughs> such a thing wasn't done. <laughs> you know, it would have been a very wide, a live topic probably in the 60s, you know, with, say, the USSR sitting there, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think around the kind of the, the, the sort of re resurgence of interest in Marx happening around the 60s and the 70s and onwards, which often focused on, you know, kind of the elements of Marxist thought, which were more libertarian and kind of rejecting the kind of rigid Stalinist authoritarian version of Marxism that people have got. I think, you know, something like this would have kind of been taken up with. I think it also would have been taken up by people who wanted to just bash Engels on the head, unfortunately, as well. And I think there's a lot of people who have a dig at Engels and put out this kind of idea that Marx is good and Engels is bad and any bit in Marxism they don't like, they dump it on Engels. I, I mean, I think that's nonsense. I think basically the two of them, you know, agreed. They, they had a huge level of agreement over whatever, 40 years. 
which is amazing. But there were differences, even if it's only difference of em emphasis, there were differences. And each of them, they were two individual people and each of them brought their own things to the table, if you like. And I think looking at those differences and those kind of the similarities and differences and kind of between the two of them can, can give us a bigger understanding of, of, of the ideas that, that both of them had. So it, it's not something we should sort of reject. I think it's something that's, that's, that's well worth looking at. Yeah, to, to, to save Marx, we must kill Alan Engels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So somebody sent me, I, I was I, I was telling people uh, online that I was interviewing you about the article and, and somebody said to me that they thought that maybe there was some more, I think this is probably from maybe Engels' writings to do with the SPD, where he, he certainly flirted more with a more long-term concept of taking over the state with a mass worker party. Yeah, I think... It I mean, he found himself in the sort of 70s and 80s and 90s in a, a different situation. For the most of the time, himself and Marx were really kind of on the fringes. I mean, obviously, in the sort of the glory days of 1848, they were in the middle of the revolution. But for most of the time, they were a minority kind of current within the workers' movement. And then from the 70s onwards in Germany, this kind of mass workers' party developed, which for the most part kind of agreed with a lot of their ideas, not as much as either would have liked it. They kept having kind of arguments back and forth with the leaders. But generally speaking, it kind of went along with them. And Engels was very impressed. And you can see him, especially in some of his later writings, kind of even just counting off the number of votes they were getting in elections and saying, well, at this rate, you know, we'll be in power before the end of the century, you know. And it's kind of, there is, I think, a very uh, a strong kind of atmosphere of, you know, the revolution is coming. This is, this is going to grow gradually and gradually. And arguing, let's not waste this. Let, let's not do anything that would jeopardize this. You know, we're, we're, we're getting to the point where soon they won't be able to, to stand up against us. We'll have more votes than them and that the revolution will happen. And I think that kind of sort of fed into some of the the ideas and not, not so much out and out reformism. Whenever kind of reformism sort of reared its head openly, he he very quickly kind of knocked it down. But I think the idea that you know, the, the, the revolution was almost, I think it's, there's some point where it says it's happening with the inevitability of a natural process, you know, almost as if, you know, night following day. And I think that kind of fed into something which grew after his death in the Second International of this sort of idea of organic growing into socialism. You just kind of, we just carry on doing what we're doing and, you know, eventually we'll gradually get there. And it's a kind of a gradualism, not necessarily reformist gradualism, but a kind of a gradual idea of going towards revolution, which kind of imposed some kind of a passivity on, 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 on the German left and meant that, you know, obviously when the big crisis of 1914 came along, they were largely kind of, you know, caught unawares. This wasn't in the script, you know. And, you know, I think, you know, Engel, without blaming Engels for what, what, the, what they did in 1914, I do think it's, it, there are questions to ask about how much he contributed to the kind of atmosphere, the kind of political culture even, where, where that could happen. So, like, was there much disagreement or what did Marx contribute to this idea then of, of the withering of the state, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I mean, I think over the years since kind of the 1840s, when they started working together, you find that what Marx and Engels are staying on the state is, is, is much the same. When this, the, the controversy with Durin came along, Marx wasn't hugely interested in it. He didn't like what he heard. But at that stage, he's knocking 60. He's kind of not in the best of health. And so it's left to poor old Engels to kind of take up the cudgels. So Engels publishes these articles. And Marx, as far as we know, didn't have a huge involvement, apart from writing one chapter on economics. During had written a history of economics, and Marx wrote a big, long critique of it. And Mark, Engels used extracts from that in his, in his articles. And then after Marx's death, Engels kind of almost tried to felt the need, I think, to claim that Marx agreed with what he had written. Uh, so he says in the 1885 edition, he said, I read the manuscript over in full to Marx before it was printed, which to me seems a little strange for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the, the book was published in sort of serial form from week to week in a newspaper. So there wouldn't have been a single manuscript. And there's certainly no manuscript like that has survived. And secondly, I don't know why it would be read to Marx. Marx, we know this from, we can look at his letters and everything. He was reading like mad. He was, you know, up almost to the last kind of couple of years of his life was devouring books. He wasn't writing as much as he had been, but he was had no problem reading. So why he would 
read that, I don't know. But this this change that happened in 1882, Marx would have been unaware of. At th that time, there's a lot of letters between Marx and Engels at that period in 82, mainly for the reason that Marx was away. They've both been together living in London since 1870. So there was less letters between them. They used to basically, Engels used to call around to Marx's house more or less every day. But at this period, there's a lot of letters between them because Marx is away. He's in the Isle of Wight and then he goes to France, you know, to try and for the sake of his health. So there's a lot of, of letters between himself and Engels going back and forth. There's no mention in any of them of Engels of this is how I'm revising the pamphlet. There's not even a mention that he is revising the pamphlet. So he seems to have just done it on his own and not bothered Marx with it. And Engels writes a letter to Germany on the 7th of March, 1883, saying, why haven't I got a copy of the pamphlet? This is scandalous why it hasn't been sent to me. This delay is terrible. So Engels wouldn't have seen the final pamphlet, nor would Marx, who died a week after that. It's strange because this quotation, the famous quotation that the state isn't abolished, it, it dies out or withers away, whichever version, is often quoted as if it was Marx that said it. There's a famous essay that Lenin wrote on Marx where he wanted to show Marx's ideas on the state and quotes that sentence. Now, I mean, whatever substantial agreement there was between them, which, which was huge, Marx could not have had any input into that sentence, which, which he never saw, um, which, which, died, which kind of he died before it, any copies of the pamphlet landed in London. So it's very strange. I think, you know, people, uh, there's a kind of this idea of sort of Marx and Engels being sort of Siamese twins and they kind of uh, agree on every single thing and there's not a single dot or comma between them. I think it's more interesting, uh, apart from anything else, if you realise that these were two separate individuals and, you know, they both brought their own concerns and, and, and interests to, to what the two of them were doing together. And sometimes, and sometimes, of course, it was Engels who was bringing the good thing to the table rather than Marx and bringing up some point. Marx would never have written about economics if it wasn't for the fact that he read an article on economics that Engels wrote as a young man. So imagine Marxism without economics. So these kind of, the kind of individual contributions they made and how they fitted into their joint contribution is, I think, something that, that's worth looking at and gives us a better, a better understanding of the, of the whole, you know? So do you want to tell us a little bit about then the publishing history behind getting your article published? Yeah, I kind of, after I finished the translation, I thought this is this kind of, this is an interesting point and deserved a kind of, you know, a, a bit of a, a bit of a wider audience. So I kind of wrote it up and then I wasn't sure where the article could, could maybe get published because the, it's not long enough or academic enough for a lot of, 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 of journals. But at the same time, it's kind of not the kind of thing you could publish in a sort of popular newspaper or magazine. Uh, the first place I tried was Monthly Review in the USA, uh, and they accepted it, and um, they proofread it and copy edited, made minor changes, which I accepted, and it was going ahead. But then I got a, an email from the editor of Monthly Review, John Bellamy Foster, where he said they decided they weren't going to publish it at all and made kind of accusations that I'd kind of made the whole thing up and falsified the evidence and, and so on. And I, I kind of wrote back to him and sort of answered him back and sort of explained to him where you know where, where the sources were I mean, one of the things he said was i hadn't translated from i hadn't used the translations in the collected works which was a problem because the original 1878 version has never been translated into english so i was forced to kind of do a new translation but it i think it seems to me uh, that was a kind of a confirmation that there are a lot of people who don't really like to question the sort of uh, the sort of received idea they have the idea that marx and engels were all you know, agreed on everything, and what Engels said is 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 grand, and it shouldn't really be questioned or kind of it, we shouldn't really kind of inquire it too quickly into it. But then the people at the IMHO journal were good enough to publish it, and that's that's that was very nice of them. It's just, I mean, I think even if people think I'm wrong, if people I think I've made a mistake here, which which could happen, then you know the way to do that is to is to answer and say where I've gone wrong. But these 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 are things which I think is worth our while discussing, not kind of. You know, sweeping under the carpet. Did you get much positive response from the printing of it? Some. I mean, there's not been a huge. There hasn't been any comments up on the website, as far as I can see. But people who've seen it have sort of said it was very good, and they kind of find it difficult to believe that this that this hadn't come up before. You know, I mean, hopefully, you know, the more people read it, the more people can discuss it, and and uh, you know, get the debate going because that's, that's that's the whole point of the thing, really. You know. Yeah, certainly in some of the circles that I run on, you know, it's very online left, you know, it's more just kind of theoretical stuff that I'd be doing. 
but like there's a lot of interest in the history of the SPD and the developments of Marx's political, you know, Marx's politics and how it developed and what were the what were the problems with SPD and et cetera. And this, you know, kind of really, you know, kind of critically looking at towards the history of the you know, 19th, 20th century Marxism to see what we can do in the future. And it would seem this is the type of stuff that, you know, a lot of people that I know would would actually be, it is, it is as in, it is an important thing for them. It's a pretty critical thing, mm. the role of the goddamn state after a revolution. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like fundamental. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of sort of fudge involved. And to an extent, you know, you kind of, we cannot sort of give an exact answer for what's going to happen after the revolution. We we may not be around, and if even if we are, you know, people who make a revolution might not listen to us, and they might be right not to. I don't know, but um, you know, I think we need to sort of face up to the facts that the way Marxism has dealt with the state, or what passes for Marxism anyway, is dealt with the state has has not been successful. It has been a failure. It's kind of given us a kind of a monkey on our back that people think we want to set up, we want to kind of do what Stalin did in the in the in the thirties or whatever. And in answering that, I think, you know, we need to have a more open approach to, to those difficulties. And we need to, I think, be more open to the idea of that what Marx said and what Engels said are things that we need to look at and discuss and, and, and question uh, and find out where either of them or both have got things right or wrong. And that, that's, that's a very healthy attitude, I think, to have to the ideas we have. Once we start sort of treating things as, as holy writs, I mean, then we're, we're just going down a a rabbit hole and people will people won't listen to us and they'll be they'll be right not to you know so andres is there are you working on anything else at the moment well the last couple of years i've been focusing on um a study of irish-speaking socialists in the early 20th century particularly three people a man called wp ryan a man called Pader macken and michael and Whalon, who were kind of different people were, were involved in the irish left also outside in the case of wp ryan who was at one point was the editor of the Daily Herald, the left-wing paper that was set up in 1912. And Padder Macken was a Dublin man who was involved in the trade union movement and was a, a Labour councillor and eventually was killed in the Easter Rising in 1916. Michal and was a man from the Aran Islands, Irish-speaking islands off the West Coast, who lived all his life in Dublin and was hugely involved in the trade union movement and was imprisoned uh, in the 1913 Dublin lockout and again in 1916. And... I mean, it's really interesting to me anyway, when to go into the, the way they, all the stuff they wrote, which is kind of almost forgotten about. It's kind of stuck in old newspapers. But there, there was a really vibrant left at that time in Ireland. And there was a really vibrant Irish speaking element to that, to that left. And it's kind of the, the reason it interests me is partly because, you know, I've been there myself, all the kind of challenges of, of sort of being involved in, in campaigns and, standing out on the street, giving out leaflets and sometimes being very successful and sometimes being very unsuccessful. And it's, it's, it, it intrigues me to go into the kind of challenges that people faced over the years, trying to kind of the ups and downs of, of being a socialist in Ireland at the time or being a socialist in Britain in the case of Ryan, who spent most of his, most of his life in London at the end. But it, it's, it's, it's kind of rediscovering, re-sort of excavating the, the, the socialist tradition in Irish so that people realise that when people are expressing socialist ideas in Ireland, in Irish, they're not bringing something in from outside. They're carrying on a tradition which has always been there, which has always been been very strong, which has always been, you know, as strong as, as the socialist tradition in general, which has been a part of it. And also, I think, reminding other socialists that, you know, the Irish is, is, is a language where these ideas have been expressed as well and where, where they should be expressed still today. So it's, you know, trying to sort of link the present and the past, I think, trying to sort of use the, the sort of the past to, to learn lessons that we can apply in, 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 in the future, if you like.